Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Masley, and I'm really glad to be back with you today. And I invited a special guest, one of my own doctors, Dr. James Lever. Um, he's the founder and director of Regenix in Tampa Bay um, Regenix at Gold Coast Orthopedics in Florida. He is a former officer for and physician and educator at the Air Force for 11 years, including he used to work with the Vice President of the United States. And he's offering some of the most advanced um, therapies in the country, I think, for managing arthritis. So I think he was a great person to invite for this um, talk today. I've been doing surveys each year and looking at what topics you, are my listeners, wanted to talk about. And arthritis was at, at the top. So I'm very happy to have Dr. Lieber here today. So uh, Dr. Lieber, really glad to have you with me. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, I appreciate it, Dr. Masley. I enjoy talking to you. So can you tell us, you know, just generally about what is our, let's start with the basics. What's arthritis? What are the common types? How, when we think about it, how should we, and, and maybe how should we be thinking about the arthritis if we want to minimize any symptoms from it? Yeah, so, I mean, there are many different kinds of arthritis. And I think when most people think of arthritis, they're thinking of the, uh, the wear and tear, aging type of arthritis. We call that osteoarthritis. But there are other kinds of arthritis, which I'm not going to really talk about much here today, which are called autoimmune type of arthritic diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus induced or various other kinds of arthritis. But osteoarthritis is the one that people think of as that wear and tear um, arthritis. And uh, there are a lot of different ways to address that. Most of them are symptom control type of strategies. I mean, I should, I should state that just because you have arthritis doesn't mean you have to have pain. We all have arthritis in various parts of the body and don't even know it. Uh, but once arthritis becomes painful and someone seeks attention for it and is looking for advice, uh, you know, it makes sense to start with less invasive, more lifestyle type of uh, uh, advice, weight loss, uh, changing your eating habits, uh, exercise of various kinds, which may include uh, um, supervised exercise with a physical therapist, um, and less invasive type of uh, uh, management strategies like um, manual medicine and acupuncture. These are all reasonable strategies, wearing a brace. There's a lot of different ways to go about this. Then you kind of get into what uh, physicians typically will recommend, which will be often medications. Uh, like Tylenol or anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, and I'll talk, I'd like to talk a little bit about why those are not always a yeah, great I idea. I also want to come back to those yeah. medications that are over the counter and commonly used. But many of the lifestyle treatments we're talking about are treating inflammation, right? I mean, the, the joint has a cartilage layer and as it with some wear and tear or injury that breaks down, inflammation incurs, you know, it's like a fire, so to speak, going on inside that joint and we're trying to calm it down. It's, I mean, that's how I see it. I wonder if you look at it any differently. I mean, it is, it is that to, to a large extent, uh, but then I think people take that and make, make the wrong uh, decision that anti-inflammatory drugs or anti-inflammatory injections like cortisone uh, seem to make sense because you're trying to get rid of the inflammation. What's not often talked about or recognized is what the side effects of those things are. If you start to lose cartilage, as you described, uh, you lose about 4% per year in a knee, as an example. That's just ongoing. It keeps happening year after year. If you take an anti-inflammatory drug on a regular basis, uh, aside from all the other systemic issues that we can get into, as far as the arthritis goes, you will actually double your rate of cartilage loss to about 8%. Right, so you're losing 8% per year instead of four. You're literally... Yeah doubling the damage that occurs to your joint compared to normal aging. Correct, if you do that on an ongoing basis, right? And then cortisone injections, which we uh, are very commonly uh, recommending as a medical profession to people who have arthritic knees, hips, spines, um, that will also, in a knee, for example, will increase your risk of needing a knee replacement down the line. We know it kills local stem cells, it increases the wear on the cartilage. It so. It's not just about inflammation in the sense that we can stop, we, can, we know how to stop inflammation with medications, but there are side effects to those things. Yeah. Lifestyle is a good way to approach that, to try and decrease total body inflammation. Yeah. And then also with lifestyle, hopefully you lose weight. Uh, we can 
change the mechanical load on the joints through through weight loss. So that's another component of it, not just the inflammatory. Part. I mean, that is something I've noticed having come to your office is that you've got detailed information on diet, exercise, supplements that help with inflammation. In contrast to the drugs that make your joint feel better but accelerate the destruction of the joint, the lifestyle is probably good for your joint and it's anti-inflammatory and makes it feel better. So the diet, the exercise, the supplements can be really useful. So I don't, I don't wanna, I, I wanna just set that distinction that they're both all anti-inflammatory, but some are good for you in the long term and some are really bad. And the drugs are mostly bad. How about Tylenol? You didn't, you know, I, I've really I have learned from you that anti-inflammatory drugs, the ibuprofen, naproxen, um, those type of agents, Bivox, Celebrex, all of them, you know, can make you feel better in the short term and ruin your and accelerate the damage in the long term. But what about Tylenol? So, you know, from the best of our understanding, Tylenol does not have that kind of a negative effect on the joints. It also, uh, through laboratory testing, we know that Tylenol doesn't have a negative impact on the growth of your own healing cells, uh, whereas those anti-inflammatories can. So I think Tylenol, as far as uh, orthopedic conditions are concerned, um, if it's effective for a person up to a certain dose is fairly safe. Tylenol can be very dangerous and if taken in, in, in higher doses than than maximum uh, recommended dose, and some people do that. And of course, you and I have seen people with uh, acute uh, liver failure from Tylenol overdose and the ERs, et cetera, over the years. But um, but Tylenol within a certain range is a fairly safe uh, medication. Yeah, one of my concerns about Tylenol, if you're using it every day long term, is it really depletes glutathione. That's like the most important antioxidant um, reagent in the body. So we're depleting that. And some of the neurologists, functional medicine neurologists I've worked with in the past are concerned that taking high dose long-term Tylenol might even accelerate memory loss and cognitive decline. So yeah, it's interesting. I for many years, and I don't know if there's any good research on this, but I've recommended if you're going to be on Tylenol on a regular basis, I would recommend that they also uh, take N acetylcysteine, which is used in the ER for Tylenol overdose, but can be used to hopefully replenish some of that. Uh, glutathione. glutathione. Although I, ju I just I just read recently that the FDA is considering um, uh, uh, taking that off the market uh, because there's uh, uh, somebody wants to make it into a, a, a drug of some sort, and uh, that's uh, that's been that was just recent within the last few weeks I read about that. Oh really? Okay. So, but yeah, that would make a lot of sense to me if someone was using Tylenol long term for arthritis that they may want to consider adding N-acetylcysteine to help boost their glutathione levels back up. So what are other non-surgical treatment options that are available that you use in your practice that people should be thinking about? Some of the orthobiologics, for example. Yeah, so I should explain what that means. You know, Ultimately, my goal has been uh, based on what we've been talking about. I would like people to try and avoid the use of NSAIDs or anti-inflammatory drugs chronic use of Tylenol if, 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 uh, if there's an issue there, cortisone injections, narcotics, which we didn't talk about, which have their own set of issues that people are uh, hearing about in the news all the time, and then uh, unnecessary surgeries. And there are so many of those. And not all of those are gonna be successful and they're, they, they carry serious risks. So we, uh, along with others in the country, have um, uh, been doing a different strategy. What we're trying to do is help the body uh, naturally, in a sense, heal, or strengthen tissue or naturally decrease inflammation in a much more powerful way than we could with, uh, uh, with just uh, um, supplements, for example. And the body normally heals uh, through a very standard mechanism. It's the same way, no matter how you injure yourself, wounds, internally, if something occurs, your body sends platelets to the area to stop bleeding. Platelets then uh, open up and spill out these things called growth factors. Each growth factor has been identified. We know what they do. They call for help to resources to the area. I tell patients it's like calling subcontractors in. Each one has a different job. Uh, so they call it in. Uh, one of the phone calls are to stem cells. And we think of stem cells as being uh, baby cells that live on uh, basically ready reserve. They live in high concentration in your bone marrow in your fat tissue and in smaller quantities plastered everywhere throughout the body. So these are cells that we can utilize. We can take from a person 
we can concentrate them, we can take out the things that we know get in the way, we can make various different um, uh, ortho, we call them orthobiologic products from that person and then use them back in that person within the same day uh, as, as uh, right now that is considered to be within FDA guidance and um, compliance to be able to do that. So we can use those strong healing substances, the growth factors, the platelets, the bone marrow um, as a liquid. And then that liquid can be injected into di different tissue that's either damaged, uh, weakened, inflamed. Mm -hmm. And then the key is actually placing these needles safely, accurately, uh, as painlessly as we can into these tissues uh, to try and strengthen them using various image guidance tools like live x-ray, live ultrasound to place the needles everywhere. That's really where I think the skill and the years of training are required to get to that point. So now you're, what you're talking about is autologous or so taking someone's own cells like platelets or stem cells and being able to put those back into a specific damaged area of the body, whether it's the hip or a knee and focusing it on the injured area inside that joint to help it repair. How is that different than, you know, I read about non-autologous don't, you know, like where people are getting platelet cells or they're getting IV injections of, you know, cells from placenta tissue and other sources. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between what you're doing and what people might hear about elsewhere? Yeah, I think that's a, a really, really important topic uh, to discuss. And the FDA has become clearer and clearer as to what they allow and what they don't allow. And we're being very careful about the way we word things as well. So we are, we're, no, we're not calling bone marrow procedures stem cells. We know we're calling them bone, bone marrow concentrate, uh, but we know in that concentrated solution, there are a large number of stem cells in there. Uh, when we use the phrase stem cell or stem cell treatment or stem cell product, uh, for the FDA, regulation-wise, that's something that they think of as a drug that needs to be regulated as a drug. So that leads into these other types of tissues you're talking about. So birth tissue uh, manufacturers, these are companies that are able to obtain um, tissue from discarded birth tissue products after a woman gives birth that normally are thrown away. Uh, these would be the membrane around the baby, the amniotic membrane, the placenta, uh, or the umbilical cord. These do have stem cells in them at the time of, uh, of delivery. Uh, these companies take these, put them into some sort of a, a vial form, a powderized form that can be then sold to physicians and they are being sold to physicians throughout the country. And they tell physicians these products have millions of stem cells in them and that they work better than your young stem cells. And in fact, it doesn't even matter where you inject these because they just innately know where to go. Uh, just a whole list of falsehoods that, that occur there. So one of the problems is uh, none of these products have living stem cells in them when they have been tested by independent academic laboratories throughout the country. There are multiple published studies on this now. Number two is whether they have stem cells or whether they don't have stem cells, according to the FDA, they still need to be regulated as a drug. You can't inject these things uh, into orthopedic tissue uh, legally without that being regulated as a drug because they're not considered to be part of that person's body tissue. They're coming from somewhere else. So they are a, a drug in, in, in the simplest terms in terms of the regulations. So whether they're effective or not is a different story, right? So um, I think ultimately uh, these products will probably be considered to be effective uh, when they're researched properly, but the research is really, really in, in the infancy stages and when you research something that really has stem cells, but you're being sold something that says that don't that does not actually have stem cells, it's it's apples and oranges. It's kind of a bait and switch. Right. The, the representatives come and tell the doctors that these products have a lot of stem cells, but what they're giving people uh, are don't don't actually have stem cells. Anymore. Well, and it just inherently sounds safer to me to be using tissues that come, you know, cells that come from your own body than to be getting something from another person. I mean, undoubtedly, I yeah, there's a difference in risk associated with that. Um, and it's, you know, uh, uh, it's, 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 not a, it's not a tissue that creates a lot of reaction in somebody else. These umbilical amniotic mm -hmm. tissues that continue to continue con uh, considered to be immune privileged in that they don't necessarily cause an immune response, but they can. Um, and they are, uh, there's also risk of infection and genetic abnormalities that can be passed along. So uh, best to use your own stuff. Any, any additional issues related to the FDA and 
that regulation? Yeah, there's also, um, uh, there's a fair amount of research throughout the world, including with Regenix, of being able to isolate somebody's stem cells from uh, bone marrow or adipose tissue, and then isolating them and then growing them into large quantities. That's called culture expansion. And then you have quite a lot of uh, uh, healthy stem cells to use to inject multiple different body parts. There's some advantages to that, we think. You can inject multiple areas at the same time. You can have higher quantities. You can store those cells at uh, your current age for future use, which is a very intriguing concept. But within the United States, the FDA considers that also to be uh, regulated under drug uh, regulations and is not really allowed to be done in the United States outside of research purposes. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of value to it potentially and other countries are doing that uh, and the research is building on that. And I think ultimately the idea is it's gonna be an approved product for, for a drug as a drug in the United States, uh, one indication at a time for knee arthritis later for lumbar or whatever, something like that. I mean, currently you offer procedures like that in, if I'm correct in Grand Cayman, is that right? Yes, so we've been affiliated with an, uh, a facility in Grand Cayman. Uh, the organization has been affili affiliated for the last uh, 10 years. I've been going for uh, quite a number of years, once a month. I meet certain patients down there. Um, I meet them in Florida. We have our consultation here. If they're interested, we go down there. That's not to say that's not the only thing we do. Most mm -hmm. of the things we do are here based on what I just told you, yes. procedures in the United States. But for certain patients who are interested, we do meet down there. And pre-COVID, I was going once a month on a, a, a one week in the month to treat patients down there. Since COVID, the island has been uh, closed and uh, just communicating with them yesterday. We're thinking maybe in September, they might open again and we may start going back. Okay. Now you mentioned Regenix. You wanna explain to people what that is? So what so Regenix, Regenix is a, yeah, it's a national organization that has a lot of, uh, it's complex, there's a lot of different layers to what, what that organization is, what our organization is. I own my practices here in Florida. We have practice in Tampa, St. Pete, Sarasota, Miami area, um, but I am uh, affiliated and licensed under Regenix to do certain types of procedures. Regenix started by a couple of doctors uh, in 2005. They were the first ones in the United States to uh, begin doing injections of bone marrow for orthopedic procedures. Uh, I think they did it the right way from the beginning, collecting research data on patients, but also doing animal research at the same time. And that has just continued to grow and grow and grow. Uh, they have a very um, high level laboratory, which tests a lot of concepts for us to help inform what we decide to tell patients. All our patients are tracked by a, a team of researchers through a national database registry. That registry is the largest of its kind in the world. It tracks for safety tracks for outcomes. So we have largest safety papers in the world. We know our procedures are safe. Uh, we know what our outcomes are. Um, and um, what's interesting is because they've been able to track patients in that way, they've also started to work over the last five, six years with um, large, various different types of corporations that are self-funded and self-insured in their health plans for their employees. Mm -hmm. And we have several hundred corporations that uh, we've been able to show them that they get a tremendous cost savings if they incorporate Regenix as a part of their plan for their employees. They're saving 70, 80 percent on their orthopedic expenditures for their employees, and that's substantial. And many companies you've heard of uh, that are involved in this uh, locally, I could tell you Michaels, Dillard's, ABC Liquors, Marine Max, various nursing homes, there's a lot of them that are covering these procedures for the employees, mainly because of the cost savings data and the outcomes data that Regenix has been able to collect. How do you see this evolving in the future? Where is all where where is all these treatment options going? Yeah, I think it's uh, I think the future for this field is bright. There's a lot of research happening uh, throughout the world. Uh, there's a lot of uh, investment in in the research. Um, I think uh, the FDA's job is to keep uh, patients safe, and they're, they're taking a very cautious approach to this. Uh, but ultimately, I do think that we're going to have products that are drugs. Uh, that are, are cell-based, stem cell-based, uh, many of which may come from birth tissues, ultimately, once they're proven to be safe and effective. Um, and I think they're going to be widely accepted and uh, continue to gain uh, insurance approvals and is really a standard way to treat orthopedic conditions um, and not only save money, but also decrease the uh, unnecessary harm that we're doing with some of the standard procedures we're doing. And if in, in 
one important thing is I think uh, we'll be reducing uh, the amount of orthopedic surgeries tremendously. Um, there's a lot of orthopedists who are getting involved in this field and dabbling in it, but I think uh, uh, what you're looking for is somebody who's got uh, expertise in it. Now, when you mentioned birth tissues, I just want to clarify something here. You're talking about placenta, amniotic sac, um, the umbilical cord. I don't think you're talking about fetal tissue. And I think for some people that would be a really important issue. So I just wanted to bring up that distinction in case there was any confusion there. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very important distinction to make. Yeah, I was trying to hint at that earlier when I said it was the, the, uh, the, the, the discarded products. Basically the woman delivers a baby and normally the stuff just gets thrown away and then that's what's being used. It's not the fetus of, at all and there's no harm to the fetus. That's a whole different uh, issue. That's not that legal or, yeah. and, you know, it's, we're not gonna get into the ethics of that but that's just not something you can do at all. I just wanted to clarify that point. Perfect. Now, many of the questions I got that related to arthritis were related to the hip. Is the hip any different in terms of therapies we might offer or strategies or anything else? Hips are very uh, difficult to treat once they get into the advanced stage. We treat a lot of them because a lot of people do not want to uh, undergo a hip replacement surgery. But there are, uh, there, if, if I recommend a surgery, that's the one I recommend the most to people is a hip replacement surgery. Um, I think if we can catch it earlier, mild or moderate arthritis, we have a much better chance of um, keeping that from progressing and controlling that. Once it gets into the severe stage, we have many people who do well with our procedures, but we have many people who ultimately still will need a hip replacement. And so we have to have a frank conversation about that uh, right up front. Um, hip arthritis seems to be a little different than knee arthritis. It can advance more quickly. A lot of times people don't even notice it until it's very advanced, unfortunately. So you don't get those hints early on, or a lot of people think it's muscle tightness initially. Uh, so if you're having issues in that area, which you think are tightness that you're stretching out all the time, I would suggest getting that evaluated and getting an x-ray at least just to see uh, the status of that because you may wanna catch that earlier uh, uh, for better results. Uh, sometimes these advanced hip arthritis cases progress to uh, necrosis, which means death of the bone. Uh, and that could be very difficult to treat as well. We do treat those in the earlier stages with success, uh, but advanced stages really the only option at that point becomes a hip replacement. And I should say as big of a surgery as that is, um, that is a, a fairly successful joint replacement surgery, more successful than knee replacements. People can recover and do well with those with certain limitations, of course, afterwards. Um, and so um, uh, I don't recommend it all the time, but it's, it's certainly something that I recommend occasionally uh, to people. What's the general complication rate from having a joint replacement, whether it be a knee or a hip or something like that? I assume those two are similar. Yeah, I mean, it's fairly low, you know, it's in, in probably in the 1% range, but uh, it comp if, you, if you do it as a comparison to not having a joint replacement, uh, so that's the absolute number. If you do it compared to not having a joint replacement, the complication rate is substantial. So if you go, if you have a joint replacement, your risk of having a heart attack or stroke is 30 fold time, uh, 30 fold more than if you didn't have that joint replacement at all. So, um, and that's usually within a certain time frame after the, the replacement, within six weeks or something. And usually if you're older or have other comorbidity, uh, other types of medical conditions. Uh, but um, it's not trivial and it's, uh, it can be very serious. So we wanna make sure that we're reducing the total number of recommendations for joint replacements uh, to the ones that really, really have that as their only choice. Yeah, well, I, from what my experience, either just adding more exercise, some yoga or stretching, you know, physical therapy to help strengthen a joint, eating an anti-inflammatory Mediterranean style diet that you and I both recommend, using some supplements like fish oil and curcumin, it all helps. Yes. But if, if you're doing all, I mean, those are the things I teach to the, probably these listeners on a regular everyday basis. But if you're doing all those things, what I'm hearing is the next step up would be like, you can collect your own platelets or more advanced would be a bone marrow, inject that into the joint. And especially if that's performed early, we can help really reduce people's symptoms and improve long-term outcomes. I would say the early part is true for the hip in particular, but for other body parts, 
it doesn't have to be, we can get to that even if it's advanced. If someone has advanced knee arthritis or even advanced arthritis or disc problems in the back, we're still having success with those patients. Um, so uh, it's not too late I, I, is what I'm getting at at that point yeah. for, for many things. So it's worth a consultation. We talk about it and we talk about the, uh, the statistics that we know for, for our procedures uh, since we have that data available. So if someone wanted to ask you about, you know, how do they look for, you know, the right person? Tell me, tell me more about your practice and how someone would go about exploring these treatment options if their symptoms are not controlled with just lifestyle choices, especially when we consider that drugs like anti-inflammatory drugs are probably not a good everyday long-term choice of your treatment. Yeah, uh, so that's a good question. We have, so we have four facilities, as I mentioned earlier, one in Tampa, one in St. Pete, one in, um, uh, I, don't, I don't even know if you knew about the one in St. Pete, uh, one in Sarasota and one in Miami. We have four doctors um, uh, throughout these clinics. And uh, it's, you just call the office, uh, you, you choose to speak to the, uh, the uh, patient educator, call center, scheduler person, they will answer lots of questions for the patient. And if they're interested, they can then be set up for a consultation. And we can uh, often do the consultations this way uh, via telehealth uh, or in person. Uh, from my perspective, it doesn't matter. Uh, so that allows patients from various distances to be able to talk to us to at least do an initial consultation. We talk about whether that, uh, what options they have available to them, you know, specifically get into their issues, uh, the details of that, that's very important. And then we talk about um, uh, what options we, you know, that are available. If they're interested in proceeding, then we schedule follow-ups uh, associated with that. Okay, How, do you have a website that um, people could, you want to share that people could um, could use to reach you? Yeah, so uh, they can reach us via, uh, I'll spell it out to the website, uh, regentampabay.com, R-E-G-E-N, tampabay.com. Uh, and the one on Gold Coast, uh, the one in Miami is called goldcoastorthopedics.com. We're actually merging the websites into one. It's going to be called, it's called, and you still can get there now. It's called newregenortho.com, N-E-W, O R T H O, new region, uh, <laughs> new region ortho.com. And then the phone number uh, on this coast would be 941 357 1773. And I'm sitting in Sarasota now. That's what I mean by the West Coast. So, well, thank you very much for your time. I think, I mean, I have known you as a doctor, I've been your patient. And I, my testimony is it's really helped my joints. My, both my parents had arthritis. I started getting arthritis symptoms in my mid fifties and uh, I was, got offered a joint replacement, but I'm really glad I didn't need to go that route. I figured if I do need a joint replacement at some point, I'm gonna be happy that it was 10 or 20 years later and the techniques have gotten better in the meantime. Hopefully I'll never need it, but um, thank you. And I wanna say thank you to all of our listeners out there for tuning in. I wish you the best of health. And as we, as if you're gonna live longer because you take care of your eating and your lifestyle, that means that, you know, you are gonna live longer and you are gonna have more risk for, of developing arthritis. And I really want you to have good therapy options that are good for your health and not threatening to your health. So everyone, all the best. And Dr. Lieber, thank you once again. Okay, thanks for the time. I appreciate it.